Um, thank you for having me here, and I'm happy to uh, have this opportunity to speak in this symposium. So I speak in my capacity as an academic, and um, in being the last speaker um, in a very long day, I think what I want to do here is really just to offer some questions for reflection. Uh, and this draws from some of the themes and the uh, claims in, in my forthcoming book, which is about the history of behind the international law and religious freedom. So what is religious freedom good for? Um, despite being enshrined in international law, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, for instance, um, and almost all national constitutions, religious freedom, I think, is an endangered right and principle. But not in the obvious way that the people in this room already know. Um, we all know that there's no lack of examples of religious persecution today. Um, just look at the uh, example of, um, of uh, what's happening in the Middle East. So there's also systematic persecution of particular religious communities in um, Asia and in Africa. But I want to talk about the not so obvious ways that religious freedom is endangered, especially in this age where both uh, extreme belief and extreme unbelief actually coexist. So the first is in the way that religious freedom is framed um, in efforts um, by Western governments and groups in order to address these, um, these tragic, um, um, these tragedies. So there's an increasing amount of criticism directed towards the promotion of international religious freedom by Western governments, as well as various non-governmental organizations. As we have briefly heard from uh, Professor David Little um, during his plenary remarks yesterday evening, one main complaint is that the foregrounding or, of religion as the main explanation for almost all for almost um, for a lot of geopolitical conflicts breeds even more sectarianism or creates conflict where there is little. And the underlying premise of this complaint is a blind spot caused by the dominant secular worldview of many in the West. We know that there's an increase in terms of the number of people who are irreligious, and that's similar in number in terms um, of domestically and internationally. So in Western societies, such as Canada, where we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that protects religious freedom, religious accommodation claims are sometimes seen as unfair ex exemptions. So one would normally hear the complaint, why can't we all just follow the same rules? Or why can't they just be religious in private? Um, why consider religion special at all? Internationally, many scholars and even government officials and policymakers also tend to, th tend to th think that religion is simply a proxy uh, for other things and nothing else. Uh, for some people, it can be a proxy for a, uh, some kind of hatred against the lingering colonial presence in the Middle East, for instance, or the um, simply lack of jobs or civil order in particular societies. And I think that's because religion now is less relevant uh, in our own lives, generally speaking, notwithstanding this conference. The appeal of the terrorist group ISIS, for example, rightly or wrongly, lies in its religious mission and character. But for many people, it's difficult to comprehend and much less to relate uh, with religion's resonance and power for believers, and especially for those who believe that this life, uh, the life in this world is not all there is to it. Religious freedom presupposes, though, that one is claiming something, a freedom that is religious in character. And if we take these criticisms to their logical conclusion, and religion is just a smokescreen or a proxy for other values and factors in a particular conflict, we are left with nothing. So what would it mean then to protect religious freedom? Religious freedom is also endangered in another non-obvious sense. If we accept in principle that other countries have a right to promote, religious free, uh, promote human rights and particularly religious freedom, then we also have to take a look at their justification for doing so. So when you look at the platform of many groups advocating for global religious freedom, you're actually quite hard pressed to see the reason or rationale behind these, um, behind these particular advocacies, right? So is it really enough to promote religious freedom because it's part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. 
I'm not really sure that we should stop at that. I think religious freedom is endangered of being left at the margins and not taken seriously uh, if we don't make it speak to secular interests. So if religious freedom advocacy is undertaken at the exclusion of other important earthly and secular interests, then its advocates, both governments and non-government groups, risk religious freedom's own marginalization in the mainstream discourse as something that is only of concern, for instance, to Christian groups. And in the largely secular West, that's probably the most unfortunate situation to be in. So I have this forthcoming book uh, that um, tells the, uh, the history, the United States um, involvement in the long history of promoting religious liberty abroad in various places, partly out of genuine concern for the plight of religious believers, but also in recognition of its own national interests. And I think that concern with religious freedom abroad, as well as the creation of institutions uh, that advanced such freedom has since been copied by countries such as Canada and other European countries. And I think that's for a good reason. If it's just the United States doing that, people could easily perceive that um, it's simply trying to impose its own values uh, in these other places. But having an international coalition address this important challenge gives it more legitimacy. But as all these countries come together uh, to promote religious freedom, we also have to change the way that we talk about religious freedom. Um, governments, for instance, should take religion and the language of religion seriously. Uh, but at the same time, religion should also take the language of the state seriously. How does religious free freedom intersect with other issues relevant to a particular society? And it should be made clear that um, the pursuit of religious freedom is done not only uh, because it's a human, human right, of, although of course it's, a, it's an important human right, or that it's also the right thing to do, even though it's really the right thing to do, but that it's also in the national interest of these governments to do so, and that it need not be a zero-sum um, choice between the two. So thank you.